All right, let's start with the first conversation for the day. And if you are just about starting your career, or in fact, if you've got a few years under your belt, you're probably wondering why we're talking about retirement so early. Well, the thing about retirement is, and saving for retirement is, that you use time as your best friend and choosing the right instrument or the right avenue to save over a period of a few decades will hold you in good stead. Let me introduce my first guest. We've got Mrina Garwal, who is a founder at FinSafe. She's also a financial educator. Thank you so much, Mrin, as always, for joining in, for speaking to us on The Money Show. Now, there's a host of instruments to choose from, right? So could you take us through the key ones to watch for? Good evening, Alex. Always nice to be on The Money Show. Yes, there are a whole lot of instruments that you can consider when you're planning uh, to save for retirement. And um, of course, the good, uh, the good thing with the traditional instruments is that they give you a fixed return. So first off, for everybody who's salaried, you have the Employee Provident Fund. Um, it gives you an 8.5% tax-free, risk-free return which honestly you cannot get anywhere else because trying to generate an 8.5% return, which is tax-free, no risk at all every year is not going to be easy. And the best thing is that you can actually invest a higher amount in the Employee Provident Fund through the Voluntary Provident Fund where you contribute an extra amount. The employer does not contribute the extra amount in this particular case. Um, of course, for those who are not salaried, and for everybody else, I mean, even if you're salaried, you can invest in PPF, which is Public Provident Fund, which is open to all citizens. And uh, this is an account that you can open with the post office, you can open with any public sector bank. And there are some private sector banks which offer this as well. The current interest rate on this is 7.1%. There is a 15-year lock-in and the interest rates get reset on a quarterly basis. So I think these are the uh, really good retirement schemes that are available on a fixed return basis. And then, of course, you also have the national pension scheme. It does not give a fixed return. It gives a market link return. Of course, you have equities as well, which you mentioned, which uh, you can allocate a percentage of your portfolio to uh, with the intention of saving over a few decades, right? Considering that this will build up capital that you will eventually need. Speaking of those uh, those government schemes, the EPF in particular, it's interesting, uh, Amrin, that they've kept the rates reasonably uh, higher than the other fixed income instruments that you would get in the market. And with interest rates possibly going to head higher in 2022, at least that return for retirees is protected. But let's get to how these fixed income or these fixed return options stack up. How do you rate them how do you rank them? So, well, I would say EPF is a great instrument for the salary. With the VPF, again, uh, especially for conservative investors and moderate investors, uh, again, I think VPF is a great instrument. But what people do need to keep in mind is that uh, the interest on contribution by employees to uh, EPF stroke VPF above two and a half lakhs is going to be taxable from this financial year. So hence, uh, it'll be best if they can limit their exposure to EPF and BPF to a total of um, two and a half lakhs. And then, of course, you have option of investing in PPF. So I would put it this way, that for conservative investors, all of these fixed return options are there and they're very good to invest in. But for those who are willing to even take slightly more risk, you do have some great options in form of um, the NPS, which is, of course, very, very low cost. And you have equities as well. So I think it's a very broad range that's available for people to choose from based on their risk profile. You have a lot of people, uh, Mrin, that have chosen this VPF route. In fact, my, my own father uh, chose to do this because he was a single earner. And uh, he, he was risk averse as well. And so he maximized the amount of money. You can put your entire basic pay into the, uh, the Provident Fund through this route, right? But the uh, threshold that you were talking about is what was introduced in, in the last budget, which is 2.5 lakhs. And anything above that is not exempt. Uh, how does that work, though? Because before this, it was all exempt, 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 right? Which was what made it so attractive. 
so what happens is that what is whatever is the interest whatever is the contribution above two and a half lakhs uh totally to the epf in a financial year the interest uh, component of it is going to be uh taxable uh that is what we know so that's the way it basically works so up to 2.5 lakhs there's not the interest portion is not going to be taxable but above two and a half lakhs whatever interest is being accrued is going to be taxable and and that's uh, something that was put in place i think because the government found that very large contributions were being made uh, through the vpf um but let's talk about what you mentioned in terms of alternatives uh, the nps um, is a relatively new scheme if you think about it uh, and it's attractive because it's uh, it's something that you can uh, adjust or you can uh, fiddle around with uh, to suit your needs uh, could you talk about how this works a little bit and uh, how would you approach it all right so the first thing to understand in nps is that it's a pension scheme all right so there are two parts to it the way it works is that it is locked in till the age of 60 and not retirement so you might be retiring at 50 but the scheme is locked in till the age of 60 at the age of 60 60% can be withdrawn tax free and 40% needs to be invested into an annuity or a pension scheme so you need to be very clear that when you are investing in nps you're doing so not because there's an additional tax deduction available but you're doing so because you want a pension basically right um now there are different investment options that you can choose from so there is an active choice where you can decide how much you want in equity how much you want in government bonds and corporate bonds and for those who find it difficult to decide the allocation you have the auto choice where the funds are allocated based uh, in a predetermined manner based upon the person's age right so here too based on the risk taking ability you could choose conservative moderate or regressive uh, option um so there are various investment choices there are many pension fund managers also who are available uh, the default fund manager being the sbi pension fund but you also have a choice of the fund manager as well so i think uh, it's a good product because it's low cost uh it helps you in doing disciplined investing since you need to invest every year the money is locked in so you can't pull it out and gives you some amount at a maturity and the rest of it goes into a pension um so i think it's a good product overall to consider uh given the fact that uh the traditional product returns are coming down uh i think certainly the nps uh, is a much better option but you have to choose the right option within that the right investment option interesting right because you have various uh, approaches that you can have you can be a little aggressive you can go towards equity uh, to a large extent uh, or you can be conservative if that is your want and if you if you're risk averse so how does one make that choice and uh, could you take us through the the broad cliff notes there um so first and foremost you need to figure out uh, what is your risk profile and honestly i would always say that if you have more than 10 years to go for retirement certainly go for the active equity option the reason being that when you look at the auto choices right the allocation to equity is very low and it keeps dropping so if i'm not wrong um in the aggressive allocation uh, at the age of 50 the allocation to equity is only 20% whereas when you are in the active equity option your allocation to equity is going to be 70 75% and then it's going to keep gradually coming down in your 50s right so the the issue that i find with the other options really is that the allocation to equity is very low and that's what you actually want to maximize especially if you're in it for the long term so i would say well yes look at your risk profile but certainly i think this is a product where you need to look at taking more risk because it you are in it for the long term you're locking in funds for the long term certainly historically we have seen that equities over the long term give great returns and the best part is that this is so low cost you can't get these costs anywhere else understood um let's talk about um certain other options and 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 people often consider this there are uh various surveys that have been conducted uh, that talk about the pension plans that are offered by insurance companies and uh, a lot of people tend to go for that option uh, how do they compare with the nps because in a sense they're both pension products 
Yeah, so they don't compare really very well. And I think it's to do with the cost. So in any pension product, you have two parts. You have the accumulation phase, which is up to retirement. And then you have the distribution phase. Now, um, when you look at it, the problem is that with the pension plans from the insurance companies is that the returns are very low. They're typically between 4 and 5%. And I'm talking about net investor return, net of charges. I'm not talking about the fund returns, right? So when you look at that, you what you're comparing... Uh, building uh, your retirement corpus through a pension plan, let's say at maybe five to 6% at the max versus an NPS, which I think on an average can give you at least 10 to 12% even going forward, right? So I'm not even looking at the past returns. I'm just talking about on a very conservative basis, what you could look at getting from any equity long-term product, right? So the difference in the returns in the accumulation phase is going to be huge if you're looking at 5 to 6% versus 10 to 12%, even if you keep the returns in the distribution phase as the same, basically. And, and hence, I would never even look at a pension plan. Okay. Um, okay, that's, that's a, a fair statement to make. Um, what about equity? And this is something that all financial planners that I've spoken to, Mrin, say is an absolute must. If you have a decent runway ahead of you, this is absolutely an essential part of your portfolio. You need to have some allocation to equity. The question is, how do you approach it? Do you buy stocks as a lot of individuals have been doing since the start of 2020 or maybe midway through 2020? You have the number of DMAT accounts that have shot through the roof. So a lot of individuals are taking advice and buying stocks individually. Or do you go through the traditional route, which is to trust a mutual fund manager or in fact a mutual fund house if you're doing a passive investment strategy? Well, I would certainly go with a mutual fund and ask yourself this question. How many people have bought a stock and held it for 20 years? Right. And how many such stocks will you buy and hold for 20 years? Right. So I think for most individuals, it's very tough to actually figure out which stock to buy, when to sell it. And, you know, when you're doing it, you want to look at something that you're doing for the long term. I think it's very difficult to find that stock for most individual or for most lay investors. And hence, I would always recommend the mutual funds. Now, between mutual funds and the NPS, I think the, the, the choice really depends upon what you're more comfortable with. Like, do you want the pension? That's point number one. Point number two, if you are investing into mutual funds, you need to have the ability to hold on. And, you know, you should be very clear that you're going to be disciplined and you're not going to exit that investment at volatile time or you're not going to exit the investment because you have a need right so while i do recommend to invest in equity mutual funds certainly for retirement the the key in it is to remain invested and to be disciplined about it just like you would do in the case of nps and of course choose the fund rightly no thematic funds i mean look at core holding funds like flexi cap or index or mid cap funds a combination of these funds itself would be a good idea. And honestly, having a strategy of uh, money split across uh, NPS as well as equity mutual funds is a good idea. In this program, uh, exhort uh, viewers, exhort those tuning in uh, to treat, treat their investments into equity as partnerships where they look to have a partnership for decades rather than just a few months. So I guess if they've been listening in, then hopefully they have bought into that idea and they're buying stocks and holding them. It isn't necessarily something that you should do either or, right? You can have a combination of the various options available. So having said that, with all that we've discussed so far, uh, and there's obviously no one-size-fit-all solution, but if I were to ask you as someone looking at the various options available, um, for a salaried individual and otherwise, what would the, the, the best combination ideally be? I think the best combination would be a combination of the Employee Provident Fund, which is giving you the debt exposure, and um, NPS and uh, Equity Fund. I think, you know, those three together would be a great combination to build your retirement portfolio. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you and uh, you've broken this down in a way that I think everybody can understand and I'm hoping uh, my viewers take a lot from this conversation. Look forward to speaking to you again really soon. Thank you, Alex.